How you doing? I'm Joe Dallas. Thanks for joining me. Well, conversion therapy, that's uh, one of the hot button issues of the day. In fact, it, it seems to me with every movement, there are usually specific uh, issues that the movement locks onto. Now, for example, oh, when I was a part of the gay community, um, the legalization of homosexuality was certainly one of our rallying cry, cry issues. Um, gays in the military. AIDS in the 90s. Uh, in the early 2000s, certainly same-sex marriage. That was a, a very prominent issue, legalized same-sex marriage. Well, now, really one of the prominent rallying cries of the modern LGBTQ movement is ban conversion therapy. Conversion therapy is a destructive practice. It is harming people. It must be banned, and those who practice that thing must be punished for it. Um, as someone who has done what is often called conversion therapy, I take those accusations very seriously. That's why I am so happy to have uh, as a guest today my friend Andrew Rodriguez. Andrew Rodriguez is a Christian psychotherapist. He's a speaker, a very good one, by the way. I've heard him a number of times. He's an advocate for therapy equality. Important term. Uh, he's the director of Integrity Christian Counseling in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. He also has his own YouTube channel. You ought to check it out called Psycho Bible, Psycho Bible. And uh, we'll be telling you more about that as well. But for now, hey, Andrew, it is good seeing you again. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Thank you, Joe. Well, uh, let's put you on the hot seat. Uh, that's not going to be new territory to you, I know. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, you know, like when John the Baptist was preaching and the religious leaders came to him and said, Oh, what, what do you say for yourself? What sayest thou of thyself? In other words, you've got a message that we find to be a little weird. First of all, who are you to give this message? What the heck are you talking about? Defend the message that you're giving. That's where a lot of us find ourselves now. We're on the defense. And I don't mm -hmm. know about you, I didn't sign up to be an attorney when I got into this work. I mean, I wasn't planning to to get into all this controversy and all of these debates and all of this contention with people. Like you, I just wanted to serve people who were same-sex attracted, did not want to be, were seeking first obedience and then healing and then transformation. They were seeking all three, and I wanted to walk alongside them. That's all I wanted to do. I didn't want to make trouble. Knowing you, you don't strike me as a troublemaker, but you are one. <laughs> that's yep. on your resume guy andrew rodriguez <laughs> troublemaker extraordinaire so you're well qualified to answer some of what i call the uh, conversion therapy charges conversion therapy charges are the charges made against people who practice what they call conversion therapy um so let me ask you some of the hot seat questions that i'm sure you've heard before a lot of our viewers are going to be hearing these questions too. You know, we got the holidays coming up. A lot of people are going to come home to Thanksgiving or Christmas dinners, and they're going to have loved ones or relatives who either are themselves lesbian, gay, or transgender, or who hold a transgender or pro-gay affirmative viewpoint. And they're going to say, oh, isn't it awful when the church tells gays or lesbians that they need to turn from that so-called sin and change that's conversion therapy and it's very destructive so I, I think we can we can glean a lot of wisdom from what you have to say so with that in mind let me shoot some of these questions at you and you can help Go us understand how to answer them uh someone says andrew rodriguez you terrible person you do conversion therapy conversion therapy is destructive how do you respond well, uh, let me also plug a playlist on my YouTube channel because back in 2019, uh, Amazon started banning all of our books, you know, banned one of your books or yeah. uh, at least one and uh, Nicolosi's books and Ann Paul's and just, and that, that got me pretty fired up. So oh, me too. I started saying, <laughs> well, I'll be banned. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so I did a seven part series on my YouTube channel addressing the conversion therapy. And I always put conversion therapy in quotes myths and misunderstandings and so the first one i address is the um semantics of the very term good point point. and when people say the word conversion therapy that right away tells me that they don't know what they're talking about because the reality is none of us in this field calls themselves a conversion therapist now if you do enough research you'll find that even some of the therapists in the early days didn't mind the term. 
uh, even Nicolosi on one site, one time his website said like on the one page where he has articles, here's articles about reparative therapy, also known mm -hmm. as conversion therapy. <clears throat> yeah. But that's kind of his approach was he had like an open door kind of approach, whatever gets mm -hmm. people to come to my website. If that's yeah. a search term they're using. That sounds like here. Joe. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so yeah, it gets them in the door. Um, and it wasn't, it didn't have all those negative connotations that it now has. It was just sort of like, okay, here's someone who functions homosexually. How do we convert them to function heterosexually? Because in a technical sense, the word conversion means to change in function from one way mm -hmm. to another. Yeah. So it's not necessarily uh, in and of itself a negative term, but it became so associated with these outdated practices like uh, electroshock and aversive techniques, right. shaming the client, using coercive approaches that I've never seen in any of the ministries or the counselors I know in this field. In fact, if anything, those are approaches used by secular therapists back when homosexuality was in the DSM as a disorder. But mm -hmm. you have to go back to like the 50s, 60s, 70s for those sort of approaches. By the time it was banned, pretty much the only therapists who were still doing therapy for homosexuality were like the psychoanalysts. And they would never use behavioral techniques. It was mm -hmm. all just talk. So when I hear someone say the term conversion therapy, I don't really get really bristled or like all up in arms about it, but I know right away all right, I'm dealing with someone who doesn't know what they're talking about. Let me get mm -hmm. clarification. What do you mean by that term? When you say conversion therapy, what do you mean? So I use that as an opportunity to clarify. The terms we're using, we can't even have a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, if I have the opportunity to have a conversation, I'll try it. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. That's my I, point. I get. I can get a sense that they're even willing to have a conversation. Right, you know, right. Because I, I used to debate people. On, but you're on right. Facebook. That's where we have to start. And I think it's a good place to start. If, if we're going to talk about conversion therapy, that's a wonderful idea. But let's define it first. Yes. Good idea. I mean, I used to do a debate in, um, in college. And the first rule of debate is you have to define your terms. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, you're like this. Talking about mm -hmm. two different things. You know, if they're talking okay. about uh, aversive techniques, I'm like, well, psh, no, no, no one I know supports that. So, yeah, let's both fight against that. Well, both aversive and coercive. I mean, aversive, mm -hmm. no, we would not do that. Coercive, we could not do that. How mm -hmm. on earth, even if we wanted to, and we don't, but even if we wanted to try to coerce people who are gay or lesbian identified into counseling, how the heck would we do that? I mean, they have this idea that we're going out to the street, impossible. pulling people unwillingly into the office. That's right. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, there, there is a part of my more smart alecky part also wants to say, are you kidding? We are up to our necks in people who want to change. Mm -hmm. We don't have the time to go out and try to coerce people who don't want to change. Yeah. No, but we wouldn't anyway. That's OK. So first of all, yeah, clarifying the term conversion therapy, then the charge that the thing we do, whatever we call it, is destructive. How do you answer that? Well, once you get the definition. It, mm -hmm. that's it becomes easy to refute that because if their definition is while well, you're using torture mm -hmm. i don't do torture right all right what ne next okay i don't have to argue about something i'm not even doing mm -hmm. so if it boils down ultimately to they believe it's destructive because of their worldview all right the paradigm that the world is stuck in and unfortunately a lot of believers are stuck in this is that your sexual feelings and proclivities indicate your particular sexual identity. Mm -hmm. And if you're using a more modernistic framework, that identity is determined by nature. Right. So to try to change your sexual proclivities, your, your thoughts, your feelings, would mean you trying to change someone's sexuality at the core. And that's like trying to change someone from African-American to Caucasian. It's like that offensive, an idea that you're trying to change someone at a fundamental mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. So this is the worldview that they're coming from. And unfortunately, we're seeing more and more Christians fall into this worldview as well. Mm -hmm. And but the reality is that it's an outdated worldview. The paradigm is so outdated. And the funny thing is, the ones who are actually showing that it's an outdated paradigm in the psychology world are lesbian psychologists. Like Linda Garnett's back as early as like 2000, 2001 was talking about, we need to change that paradigm. It's not, these aren't fixed identities, gay, straight, lesbian, bi. Now it's proliferated. So every little nuance 
and your sexual experiences becomes its own identity. So mm-hmm. you got pan, you got demi, you got all these different sexualities based on whatever new sort of proclivity you have. Mm-hmm. And for us as Christians, we can rest on something that's very secure. Your sexual identity is determined by your body. Your body reveals the person. That's mm-hmm. a stable reality that we can base our identities on. Yeah. So your feelings may be in conflict with, with the reality of your body, but that does not determine what your true identity is. So Doesn't I'm also very careful. Doesn't it seem ironic? Yeah. Uh, Andrew, it, it, this is a time when we are empowering people to self-identify in some pretty extraordinary ways. I mean, mm-hmm. we are telling people, if you are biologically male, if the anatomy is all there, but you say you identify as female, okay, you're a woman. I mean, we are allowing people to self-identify in, in ways that verifiable reality seriously contradicts. Yet we're, we're all for that. Whatever you identify as, that's fine, except for this one thing. Because here, all of a sudden, all the rules change. In, yeah. in virtually every other area of sexuality, when we're talking about it from a clinical or a therapeutic perspective, we are basically saying we affirm what the individual is saying about his own identity. But on this issue, we're saying, no, 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 there's a fixed reality that you that you can't change, which, of course, uh, again, when I look at the changes I made in 1984, when I repented of homosexuality, I started addressing wounds, deficits, a lot of the soul issues that were behind yeah. it, abstained from the sin uh, I did experience significant transformation in every part of my life, my sexuality included. And yet, in my opinion, that change was not nearly as radical as somebody literally chopping up their body and pumping themselves full of drugs mm-hmm. and, and trying to force something which anatomically is really impossible to force. Uh, the changes I made, I, I would say, are very conservative compared to those very radical changes. Yet those ones are affirmed broadly, even among minors. The change I've made more and more often, people are saying, simply can't be made. Yeah. Um, and look who's so, doing destruction to their bodies. You know, talk oh, about know. destruction. <laughs> I'm helping I know. people just align their thoughts and their feelings with the reality of their bodies. Mm-hmm. That's, that brings life, not destruction and harm. Well, that's a, that, that's an operative phrase there. That brings life. Because, Andrew, there I so strongly really would want to underline that in deep black ink. We're talking about what brings life to people. When we're talking about a Christian worldview, we're talking about what our creator intended and how living with his, within his intentions brings life. I mean, that's a mm-hmm. critical point in all of this. And by the way, one, one point before we go on to the next question that you brought up, that, that whole idea of worldview, um, we are are allegedly living in a time when when people are fighting more and more for respecting other people's worldviews. Now, there are worldviews even within Christianity, I guess you would call subsets, not whole worldviews, but just for example, um, in the Catholic Church, I do not agree with the idea that someone needs to lead, lead a celibate life in order to be serving God. I, I don't agree with the concept mm-hmm. of celibacy in the priesthood or celibacy for nuns. But I respect the fact that those who do believe that must be allowed to pursue that calling as they see it. I would even say that it would be psychologically damaging for them to violate their own convictions about that. And therefore, I believe they should be affirmed in their desire to do so, provided they know what they're doing. And and I I certainly assume that they do. And and so I think that that whole idea of respecting worldview largely plays into this, even if it is a worldview you don't personally affirm. You see what I mean? Yeah. Now, here you are doing work with people who are saying, like I said in 1984, hey, Andrew, I'm attracted to the same sex. I don't, first, I don't want to give in to these attractions. Secondly, I'd like to explore whatever may have either played into them or strengthened them. And third, I want to explore my potential for change. And you are saying, yes, I will help you to do that. And some people would say, well, when you do that, Andrew, what you're doing leads people to depression and to suicide. Mm -hmm. And people will throw out either statistics or name drop. The APA says, the, the you know, Board of Behavioral Sciences say, all psychologists say, the American Medical Association yep. says, and um, there are all these studies that have shown that what you do causes people either to become severely depressed or to kill themselves. How do you respond? Well, I got even more ammunition now these days, but back, let's say, when I was being sacked in graduate school, I just mm-hmm. pointed to the reality is 
where's well I actually I didn't point them. I, I try to get them to point point me to the evidence. Where are you getting your data? Let's follow the science. Okay. So you say it's what I'm doing is harmful. Okay. Give me the facts. Where's the studies that show that someone seeing a therapist for this issue is going to be worse off? The reality is they don't have it. Uh, the APA, the American Psychological Association, in 2009 issued their task force report. They made this task force to discuss the or to explore and then come up with rec recommendations for conflicts over sexual orientation. And they admit in there, there is not enough evidence from uh, empirically rigorous studies of current day SOCI, that was a term they used at that time, sexual orientation change efforts, SOCI therapy, to show whether it is harmful or beneficial, where it is effective or ineffective. Because those are the two big attacks that we get, that what we're doing is either it's harmful and it's ineffective. Mm -hmm. But yet, that's, those are claims without basis. Exactly. If I remember their wording right, they said that it was largely anecdotal. Yeah, they the made people were making claims, but they couldn't be backed up. Yeah. Yeah. But they, they didn't have enough evidence to show, other than anecdotal, mm -hmm. <laughs> that it was harmful either. Mm -hmm. So yet that task force report was used to justify the first therapy ban in California for mm -hmm. minors. When even in there, they admit there's no evidence about the effects of this type of therapy on minors. Yes. So we're making these decisions not based on the evidence, but based on ideology. So I, I could used to just point that out. Well, there's not enough evidence. So mm -hmm. tell me what I'm doing that is understood to be innately harmful. Good. I can't, yeah. no, none of my opponents can ever point that out. It's just, well, they believe it could be harmful because, because of the worldview. Because I believe mm -hmm. if you're trying to change someone at a fundamental level, then that's, that's impossible. Therefore, it's harmful to even try. Now mm -hmm. we have evidence that shows otherwise. We have the Pila and Sutton study, the first ever prospective study that actually got a baseline level of people entering into reintegrative therapy uh, with Nic Nicolosi's practice. And we measured their uh, well-being levels using the OQ, OQ45. Mm -hmm. And their sexuality. So we can, all right, let's see. You guys say that it's harmful, ineffective. Let's find out. Every mm -hmm. six months up to two years of being in the uh, treatment, we, we measured them. And they saw within the first six months, well-being improved dramatically. You know, they, they came in at a clinically a significant level of distress. By six months, it was improved. So that they were just as well-functioning as someone walking down the street, mm -hmm. you know, a regular person. And that was the first benefit that they experienced. Mm -hmm. So that goes right against the narrative. On top of yes. that recent uh, Paul Solon study that looked at the data from the Blasnich study that said that all these people who did conversion therapy were suicidal. But he conveniently didn't factor in the timestamps of when they were suicidal and when they did treatment. Well, that's not and, a minor detail. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Sullins was able to get that data and factor that in, found out it's the opposite. They were suicidal before treatment, after treatment, they were improved. Mm -hmm. They were less suicidal. That yep. tells us that people are more likely to seek treatment are ones who are significantly distressed. So by depriving them of treatment options, we're actually making them worse off. Mm -hmm. So we got now data that goes against this narrative. Yeah, gosh, you know, I, I, here, here's what gets to me when I hear all of this. Um, when I asked for help myself, because I'm exhibit A for a lot of what you're describing, um, I, I was looking for three basic things, congruence, healing, and transformation. I didn't frame it that way at the time. I was a 29-year-old dumb young man just going, oh, I need help. But basically, I was like, okay, I repented of this sin. I want congruence, first of all, help me to live congruently with my belief system, with my worldview. I want to be in consistency with what I believe. So that's number one goal in, in therapy that I sought, congruence. Healing, help me address some of the emotional issues that have contributed to this. Transformation, help me explore my potential for heterosexual response and pursue it to whatever extent I'm going to be able to experience it. Now look, to my thinking, if even one of those is achieved, through therapy, that's successful therapy. If you help someone live in congruence with what they believe, 
that alone is going to decrease the anxiety, the stress. They're going to be healthier. They're going to be better functioning. If, certainly, if you're helping someone address their emotional wounding, that has to improve their life. And then transformation, I, I mean, again, as you're saying, there is no uh, data supporting the idea that sexual response is fixed in concrete. Now, I will grant that people will get different levels of transformation or different forms of transformation, but transformation certainly happens. So again, if those three are being achieved, even one of them, much less two out of three or three out of three, I would call that successful therapy. Now, I'm going to give a, a little pushback against what you just said there, because a little bit of caveat to how I would word that or a different qualification. Helping people live congruently with their values if their values are based in reality. Well, yes. Okay. That's what we're seeing point. now is with the affirmative right, carries, I agree. Well, they view themselves as a, a boy who sees themselves as a girl. I agree. So I, I know that. Completely agree with you on that. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So absolutely. What is healthy is I don't believe I, we can affirm a delusion. Yeah. But it's not a delusion if somebody, for example, like I mentioned the, the viewpoint earlier that I don't agree with, that if somebody is um, a leader, they should be living a celibate life as Catholic priests and nuns Sure, do. but they're still living congruently the teleology of their body. Right, and it's not it's not based on the delusion. It's based on the belief that I don't agree with, but it's not delusional. It is delusional yeah. to say, okay, I, I'm Napoleon Bonaparte, affirm me. Oh, well, I'll help you live in congruence with your belief. <laughs> of course, no, you're yeah. not going to do that. Okay. Um, somebody at that point would say, okay, but you guys, you especially, Andrew, Mr. Conversion Therapist, it's proven that nobody can change their sexual orientation. I, I'm, when, when people state that as fait accompli, it's been proven that no one can s change their sexual orientation. How did we get to the point where that became such a commonly accepted belief? And how do you respond to it? It goes back to worldview. All mm -hmm. right. So no one can change their sexual orientation. Here's a wild thought. Sure, no one can change their sexual orientation. If you understand your orientation being the direction of which your body is designed for. We're stuck in this paradigm that your feelings are what determine your orientation. But if you understand that it's your body that determines your orientation, then correct, you can't change that. A male's body makes no sense by itself. The female body makes no sense by itself in the sexual difference. Your body is meant for union with the opposite sex. And that's the orientation of your body. So when we base our identity, our sexual identity on the teleology of your body, the purpose of your body, then correct, you cannot change that orientation. But if you're talking about your sexual feelings, well, that's a different story. So I, talk, I make a distinction between orientation and that's why I don't really use that term. It's not a very helpful term because people have a different philosophy right. that determines the way they I don't find it, it helpful either. So I use same-sex attraction or same-sex eroticization right. or same-sex sexual attractions to make a distinction between, because some people's attraction is actually more uh, admiration mm -hmm. and it might not be actually sexual. And that's one right. thing that happens in therapy. I help people understand because a lot of times that erotic attraction to another guy is really them eroticizing a, a, a good attraction, a, a, an admiration for someone, or maybe mm -hmm. a, an attraction that brings them back to their uh, woundedness or envy that they have or insecurity they have. So when they understand the root to it, then, okay, now they can put that, con that attraction in the right context. So we use a curious approach. And what we discover is that as you take that curious approach and you find where, where it's rooted and you work on those, the attractions of feelings may change consequently. Well, again, I, I could affirm it. that firsthand that, because that's exactly what my therapist did with me. He, mm -hmm. You know, he, he took, as you are saying, a curious approach to it. And the more I explored the difference between sexual desire and either admiration or, in my case, a lot of envy as well, uh, what, that alone diffused a lot of the power of the attractions. No question it did. Yeah. Yeah, I was just working on that with a client this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, the envy he has for certain guys. And, well, what happens when you look at your body? Now, it it's, it's plays into everything. There's insecurity when he looks at his own body. Mm -hmm. So as we grow in acceptance, this is the ironic thing. They accuse us of shaming people. But yet what we're doing is helping them grow in acceptance of the truth of who they really are. And we're helping them reduce shame. The, the power in the session, when I'm working with someone and they're sharing with me their, their fantasy or their behavior that they've acted out in. I had a client tell me about this way he acted out. And he's like, you sure you want to hear it? I'm like, yeah, go ahead, share with me. And I don't want to get explicit here, but he shared yeah. with me the details. 
And for me to just sit there with it and listen and show understanding and acceptance, mm -hmm. that's powerful. That reduces shame. And when there's a reduction in shame, now you can look at the experience more clearly. And it, it takes the power out of the appeal of the experience. Mm -hmm. It's when things are in darkness, it keeps Huge you in bondage. Thing. Absolutely. And I think that, that it is both more practical and biblical to reframe the concept of orientation the way you have, Andrew. I think that's very important, that orientation has to do with what we genuinely are, not just what we feel. And yeah. I think on a personal note, I've often said when I repented and began living in alignment with what God created me to be, it felt like I was coming home. It had a feeling of sort of eternal inevitability, like, oh, my gosh, this is what I was made for. I am living now in real congruence. And that's when it went from just obedience into a sort of, a, oh, wow, this is harmony. At first, it was just I have to live obediently and stop doing that. And then it became I'm living in congruence with what I was intended. That was a critical point in all of that. One, and one last real... Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. That's the point why we're seeing so many Christians now supporting this gay celibate Christianity while at the same time, they're like, Oh, but we shouldn't support the trans movement, but they already, they already conceded too much because mm -hmm. they're, they're allowing their sexual feelings to determine sexual identity. But then they're saying, no, your body determines what your gender identity is. Mm -hmm. You don't see that. You can't have it both disconnect. ways. You can't have it both yeah. ways. Yeah. They don't no, see exactly. how the teleology of the body determines not just your gender, but also your sexual orientation or the way in which you should be functioning sexually. So, yeah. And, and that really underscores something that I think God made very clear to me when I first repented in 1984 was that you are never again to refer to yourself as a gay person. And that was not because God was saying, Joe, pretend you're something you're not. No, not at all. In fact, I felt a very deep conviction that I must be honest about whatever feelings or temptations I have. However, I was not called to identify by those. There is a difference. And that's an important difference. Real important yeah. difference. Um, by the way, I think it's funny. I, I mean, Obviously, you and I could have this discussion for hours on end. There is so much to say, and it's frustrating to be able to have so little time in which to say it. But there is one more question I did want to pose to you. And this is not so much about how to answer a particular accusation. I'd really like your feedback on this or your sense of where we're going. Those of us who do this kind of work and churches who take a stand on this issue, churches who preach the full counsel of God when it comes to human sexuality, what do you think we're going to be facing in the next five to 10 years? Where do you see us headed? Okay. We're going to face increased persecution, but also increased demand for our services. Well, that's an so, interesting combination. Because the whole LGBT movement is based on lies. The activist movement is based on lies. The lie of not denying the reality of our bodies. Mm -hmm. And the only way it can stand is through, it's through coercion through legal coercion, through banning and censorship, and through social engineering, which is what we're seeing through all the propaganda in our schools and our media and television. But the body does not lie. Your body is going to betray you at some point. You even hear some trans activists talk about this. I feel that my body betrays me. So I think I kind of thank God for the trans movement because in that way, the LGBT movement bit off more than it can chew because people were being very accepting of homosexuality. Now the trans movement, there's starting to be some pushback, but eventually what's going to happen is there's going to be people who realize just like in the seventies, what started Exodus is going to happen again. Right. All people who've lived homosexually and did not find it fulfilling. They're going to come to that realization as well. I know that there is going to be a revival among the LGBTQ and the church needs to be ready. So we need to have support. We need to have legal support We need because we need to be protecting the rights of people to get the help they need when they leave the LGBTQ. Or if they were never identified, but at least when they realize, I want to start getting help in this issue. All right. I'm at the point where I keep getting people who watch my videos. They contact me and I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I got it. I'm like, I'm pretty full. And I, the sad thing is I don't know enough other therapists that I can refer them to. Mm -hmm. And like it or not, if this is like, well, I don't want to touch this issue you're going to have to touch this issue because we're going to have a flood at least of the detransitioners who are going to be looking for help oh, after yeah. they realize the truth. 
Abs that is inevitable. Absolutely. So we got to be prepared to address this issue with compassion, with competence. So you need to be trained up. You need to know the facts about this stuff. You need to have effective ways of helping people. And when I talked about therapy, true therapy is about helping someone gain understanding and healing. It's not just talking to someone and affirming every thought they have about themselves. That's not mm -hmm. therapy. It doesn't heal anyone. So you need, even as a counselor who's in the X game ministry field, a lot of the people I know myself for years, before I started getting more, more advanced training, all I knew to do was to help people gain insight. I had a lot, I had really keen insights on things, but then they, they got the insights. They understood a lot of contributing factors, but I wasn't trained in approaches or strategies for how to help them resolve those, those wounds and traumas right, that they right. brought up. So I think what I want to see more is Christians who are uh, using both a ministry approach and a clinical approach. We need more mm -hmm. of a marriage of the two because mm -hmm. we got to be equipped for, I see a lot, not just trans, but also former uh, homosexually identified people coming in and looking for serious help. Well, and to me, I mean, there's no contradiction in saying we, we of course, want to help people with their exodus, but for heaven's sakes, we don't want to leave them in the wilderness. There is a Canaan to go in and to conquer. So, yeah. uh, of course, we should be about resolution. I mean, it's interesting also what you are foreseeing, and I, I would say it sounds just about right, um, increased persecution, increased opportunity. So that yeah. tells me I need to hire more staff and beef up my security and consult with an attorney all at the same time. It's, yeah, it's really? <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, Matt, it, it's an honor, I think. In fact, I know it is an honor to be able to walk with people mm -hmm. when God interrupts their lives, makes them hungry for something better, brings them first from death, first from death to life. They're, when they're converted, they're born again. I'm, I'm all behind that kind of conversion therapy. And then having been born again, when they have either settled for error in their life or they've indulged error in their life or whatever, and they come to us and they say, hey, I want help. I mean, incredible honor to be able to walk with them. And that honor outweighs any pushback we're going to be getting. Absolutely yeah. does. And uh, people are going to want to contact you. What's the best way to reach you if they want to either have you come to speak or they want to know more about your services? Uh, well, check out my YouTube channel, uh, Psycho Bible, Babbling About Psychology and Theology. <laughs> uh, find me on YouTube or Facebook. You can go to my counseling services website, integritychristiancounseling.care, and you can submit an inquiry there as well. That's great. And I, I have watched many of your videos on YouTube. They are excellent. It's some of the most informed and I really would have to say some of the most well put together presentations on this topic today. Thank you so Thank much you. for taking the time to be with us. Thank you for the stand that you're taking and the work you're doing. I want to talk with you again real soon, Andrew. Oh, thanks God so much, bless. Joe. And thank you for taking the time to be with us. Sure appreciate that. Um, if you have not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, would you do that? Hit the bell and subscribe. Let me know that you did so I can thank you personally. We'd love to uh, be able to keep you abreast of all of our projects that are coming up and certainly of each episode of Christians in the Cancel Culture. Speaking of which, this podcast is based on a book I wrote that came out last year, Christians in a Cancel Culture, available through Amazon.com. That's written to equip the average believer to be able to intelligently and biblically discuss these hot-button issues. Also, if you would like to uh, support our work here, Cloudfire Ministries, just go to joedallas.com slash giving, joedallas.com slash giving, so you can uh, partner with us in providing free content, and uh, we'd love to have you align with us in that. Well, we're here with you every Friday. I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Meanwhile, let's keep in mind our job description. We're servants of the Lord. Well, Paul told Timothy, the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle to all, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those who oppose themselves, if perhaps God will grant them repentance according to the acknowledging of the truth, the 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 25. Let's keep that in mind, okay? When it comes to truth, it is not just where you stand, it is also how you stand. Good seeing you. See you next week. God bless.